This video looks at some challenges associated to the use of pole placement algorithms. The early videos then have introduced the concept of state feedback and demonstrated that it moves the poles. So state feedback where you have a system of the form x dot equals ax plus bu and the state feedback is u equals minus kx and what you're trying to do is tr place the poles of the closed loop system a minus bk. Now, it's shown that when the system is fully controllable, the poles can be placed arbitrarily, so wherever you want them to be. This video considers the repercussions of having to place all the poles, or what many people will call a pole placement design. Now, there's a bit of a comment here. We haven't really considered the discrete case MOS in this series because the discrete time case is the same as the continuous case in terms of the concepts and algebra. Pole placement with a canonical form. So this is just very briefly a reminder of how you might do a design. So if you have a system in canonical form, then when you find the closed loop A minus BK, you find the top row coefficients depend on the parameters in your state feedback k. And so you can choose those top row coefficients to be exactly what you want. And it also happens that those top row coefficients are the coefficients of your closed loop pole polynomial. So you can choose the parameters of the closed loop pole polynomial directly by choosing the parameters ki. And for this video, we'll use only canonical forms just for illustration. It's not exclusive. You could do other examples, but it makes the illustrations easier. So what we want to do is look at the consequences of pole placement. So that's the most important, the consequences. How easily can you determine a good location for each and every pole? What if you put, choose your pole positions poorly? Can you come up with a systematic design methodology for choosing your poles? And what we're going to show here, that's the key point, is that being able to place the poles, so that's what we've shown so far, that pole placement says, yes, you can place them wherever you want, is not the same as knowing where to place them. They're two different decisions. Yes, I can place them wherever I want, but what if I don't know where to put them in the first place? Some numerical examples then. We we'll start with a simple two by two example, and you'll notice what I've done here is I've given quite a lot of rows in the C matrix, so I'm extracting different possible outputs so that I can explore how this behavior works depending upon the definition of the output. Now, here's your pole placement design. You'll notice the closed loop pole um, parameters are given by 1 plus k1 and 2 plus k2. So if I choose arbitrary pole positions, minus p and minus q, then I can achieve whatever p and q I want by corresponding choices of k1 and k2. So I'm not going to say what those values are. The key point here is just to show that you can choose p and q however you like, and I can get the corresponding k1 and k2. So this is what happens. If I choose to put the poles both at minus 0.5, these are the sorts of responses that I get from the system. So these lines here correspond to the different outputs. So those are the different rows in the C matrix. But this bottom one corresponds to the input signal. So how heavily am I actuating the system? And you'll see I've changed, I've used different poles, minus 1, minus 1, minus 2, minus 2, minus 3, minus 3, minus 4, and minus 5. Now, the key thing to look at here is not only the convergence rates, which will clearly change as you speed up the poles, but also the corresponding inputs. So here's the input when I have minus 3, minus 3. Here's the input when I have minus 4, minus 4. And here's the input and have minus 5, minus 5. Now look at this value here. It starts at around 50. And compare that to the value we had here, which was around 5. So nothing is for free. What I've done is I've speeded up the system, but at the cost of a very aggressive input. Now the other thing you'll notice is that some of these outputs are oscillatory. Not, perhaps oscillatory is a bit unfair, but they do have a, a slight overshoot before they then 
come down to settle. And you don't have that when you look at the choices of slower poles. So the question you're going to ask is, where's the best position to put the poles? Here, I have fast convergence. But I've paid for it with a very aggressive input and some overshoot in transients. What happens if I change just one of the poles and the other pole I always keep at minus 1.2? So you can see I've made one of the poles get faster and faster, but the other pole I've kept at minus 1.2. And now you look at these plots and they all look fairly similar. And you might say, well, it seems to me that changing this second pole has had very small impact. It's done almost nothing. It's done something. You can see a slight change but it's not significant. And you might be saying to yourself, well, what's going on? I'm not quite sure how I should choose these poles in the first place. Second example. Here, this is 3 by 3. And again, the algebra is shown here to demonstrate that I can choose my closed loop poles, minus P, minus Q, minus R, wherever I like. And no matter where I choose them, I can find the corresponding parameters for my steep feedback so that I get those poles. And that's a standard canonical approach. So here you'll see I've tried again some different pole positions. Here very similar, minus 0 0.5, minus 4, minus 0 0.5 and those responses look reasonable and the input signal looks reasonable. What happens down here if I go for poles minus 5, minus 4, minus 5 and you can see lots of oscillation so that's clear but what you can't see because I've not shown it clearly is this input signal which actually goes a long, long, long way down and is very aggressive indeed. And you'll notice as I've speeded up the poles, so here's the input signal for this one, here's the input signal for this one, and as I've speeded up some of these poles, the input signal has got more and more aggressive and I've got more and more oscillation in my responses. So you might be looking at these and saying, actually, I favour either, sorry, I favour either this one or this one, but these three perhaps I don't like. So what's the summary? With a small number of poles, as in low order systems, maybe two states and three states, you could do something like a root loci design or similar to get an idea of where are sensible closed loop pole locations. <coughs> However, with a high order system, this is less obvious and systematic. So a general piece of guidance, and this is very general, you mustn't take it as being too precise, is that poles should not be moved too far from their open loop positions. Because if you're trying to move them from their natural positions, then it's likely you're going to have to use aggressive inputs because you're trying to make the system behave in a way that is not natural for the system. And then you're likely to get sensitivity. But again, you'll notice this comment is rather loose and vague, and you're not going to be using the word systematic. So in summary, when a system is in controllable form, every coefficient of the closed loop pole polynomial can be defined as desired using state feedback. So you can put the poles wherever you want. But this is not the same as knowing a good place to put the poles. And in general, you'll see selecting fast poles may not imply good overall behavior. So we need a more systematic design approach. So we've shown you how to do pole placement in these videos. And yes, you can do it but we haven't shown you how to choose target pole positions, and that's a key issue. As a secondary point, we've also yet not yet tackled things like tracking, so how do you get non-zero steady-state outputs, um, how do you include integral action, and things of that nature.